Welcome to part two. In this part, we will look at biological transmutation. In part one, we discussed transmutation in experiments. In this part, we will focus on biological transmutation, looking at some of the early work by scientists looking at seeds and plants and how they generated minerals seemingly out of nothing. We will also look at some of Kavran's work and try and understand what might have actually been going on. But for now, let's let's turn this back on its head. Um, so, so yeah. So we've talked about um, experiments where effectively we're releasing a lot of energy, we're producing many elements and producing a lot of heat. But obviously, when we looked, when I looked at biological transmutation, we almost have the opposite. We have uh, evidence from a wide catalog of of uh, people. Uh, looking at um, seeds, looking at plants, and their seeming ability to generate new elements within the plant itself. So, you know, I mean, I, I don't want to go through specific examples, but certainly the the first group of, of people that I looked at uh, looked at plants and, and how they were able to, they analysed the seeds um, before and afterwards, and identified that actually there were more minerals present than should have been available to it uh, during its, you know, the, the the point at which the the seed was made or the sapling was was grown. And obviously, at the time, that that was difficult for them to to explain. How can it be that plants can create elements? And and I think for you know that and and other reasons these experiments are sort of labeled as not being you know true that you know that either they did experimental errors or you know they forged their results but the reality is when you start looking at all of the evidence of all of the experiments conducted they all point to the same thing which is that somehow plants are able to take and, and the same applies to animals but let's start with plants they are able to take you know whether it is um uh, well, let's look at some of the examples here. You know, they're taking calcium in particular, and they can convert it into potassium. And sometimes they can do the opposite. So depending on the environment, almost, they're able to create whatever is required, whatever is lacking, and they're able to produce that. So, so again, the question then becomes, I mean, I'm not necessarily saying that we can answer how they do it. But again, if we looked at Sam then we can sort of start to understand why that might be happening. Because, yeah, as you show on the screen, it, it is just just one step to go from calcium to potassium. So what we pointed out earlier there is that if we take a look at potassium-39, and that's the, one of the strengths of this model, you just have to look at the nucleus, interpret it, and you can already make it an assessment, if you will. So potassium-39, we see two of those yellow spheres again, uh, meaning in classical terms that would be neutrons, right, two of them. And it only needs one hydrogen or one proton, and it would transmutate into a calcium. And like you said, um, this step is easily done, again, without the mechanism here, right, but this would be a logical step, a logical transmutation step. No issues at all, it would yield some energy, uh, in the order of MeVs per atom, right? Several MeVs per atom. And it should be an easy step. And if you look at those experiments that you were referring to, we often see things like a potassium number 19 going to a calcium number 20. Or in the same uh, uh, line of thinking here, uh, where is it? Uh, the sodium here, number 23, uh, num uh, element 11, we have a similar setup and it would become magnesium, right? The similar change there as the other one. And we see it with manganese to iron, we see it with copper to zinc. It's always that one step or lacking one proton difference. And if you look at those experiments, I mean, protons in water, it's readily available there, always. It's always, it, organisms in life is actually always in a watery environment. So you have a boatload of protons. 
And these experiments seem to show this, that apparently biology is capable of doing this. How is another question, of course. Yes. Um, and, and a part of the answer, I think, is, is in that paper that um, someone had posted. Uh, I, I need to find that the the name of the person who posted it, but essentially it's a, a piece of, uh, I don't know whether it's declassified, but it was an experiment run for the government was it the government yes i think it was a, a some branch of the u.s government somewhere uh, decades ago i think it was and it was declassified in my mind in my memory and uh what it alluded to and that was quite phenomenal in, in my mind is that the atp and i forgot the exact terminology but it ends with triphosphate the tp there and it's uh, the most common substance in any organism. It's uh, responsible for energy transfer throughout your body, if you will, right? And it does all kinds of things, which are many known chemical, biochemical processes. And we're not saying those are not happening, right? We acknowledge all those chemical processes. However, that ATP, when combined with magnesium, which is uh, what most of organisms have too, including animals and humans, and plants use it for their uh, green leaf, their chlorophyll. So they have a magnesium and an ATP, and it makes a three-dimensional uh, roundish molecule whereby the tail, the triphosphate, connects through the magnesium to the head of the, of the ATP, if you will. It's a bit like a mouse situation, bulky thing, tail on it, and the tail connects to the head through the magnesium. And it is in that... Uh, uh, paper that you're showing here and then you can and with the magnesium you get a cyclo atp now the interesting thing is this and that's what pointed out that's where it is so you have a cyclo a, a curved one if you will <clears throat> with the magnesium there in the center just above the two rings so you get a very three-dimensional ring there and what the authors of this uh, uh, paper say is that this little thingy here that we're looking at right now which is very common in any organism, acts like a miniature cyclotron, meaning it's a particle accelerator. It's a particle accelerator of biochemistry or origin. That's no, how they say it is, right? It's not, not my terminology, it's not my original thinking, it's their thinking. And this paper talks about that, how this little, mo well, little this molecule here acts as a cyclotron, acts as a particle accelerator, whereby one proton, right, in the watery environment, and there's lots of protons there always, uh, can be accelerated and fused to another metal. And that is the conclusion of this paper, and that is what we see in many, many experiments. But again, the current models do not very much allow it. You know, how can biology do nuclear transmutation? But that's because we think of part big particle accelerators, high energy neutrons, uranium and whatnot, right? But biology, well, it's much smarter. It can do things. Much more efficient. Much more efficient. You're talking one molecule here acting as a particle accelerator. Eat that, sir, right? <laughs> It's very, very small, and it can do transmutations. And there's a total logical, totally logical explanation here, um, if one wants to accept it or not. That, that, that's for everybody themselves to make up. Yeah, but but ag again, the, the evidence, if you look at the experiments that are carried out, certainly would support that that idea. I mean, certainly if we sort of move on and 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 and, and talk about you know, probably the most famous person associated with this, which is, which is Kavran. And, uh, you know, he did many experiments. And, and, you know, I want to look at some of those equations in a second that he came up with. But um, he obviously sort of linking back to this idea of plants, he started by looking at uh, chickens. Well, he didn't start, but one of the things that he looked at was, was uh, chickens, uh, which... Uh, in uh, I think it was Normandy, uh, there wasn't enough, uh, and I don't know, maybe it not be Normandy, but wherever it was he was studying them, th there was no uh, calcium available to them on, on the ground. Uh, and yet when they uh, were still able to create eggs, 
which contained calcium. And the question that he sort of raised, well, how is that possible? And he speculated that it was uh, potassium in the mica that they were consuming and then transmutating in their body into calcium to produce for the shells. And again, this paper here may suggest potentially a mechanism by which animals and plants are, are capable of doing that. So if I can make another connection there. Um, yeah. Um, if we ask the question why, why does nature do this, right? Why would you make calcium? I mean, there's lots of calcium in the environment, right? It's an abundant element. Or why would you create silicon? Well, if we look at the dissolvability, for example, of elements, calcium and silicon are not that solvable. Calcium more or less, definitely, but silicon is not readily uh, available in water. And if we look at the concentration in seawater, when we look it up, it gives us the data that it's about one ppm. So one in a million water atoms is a silicon. And if we are looking at uh, diatoms, the algae in the sea, which is a huge biomass uh, responsible for almost half of the oxygen production, I believe, on Earth. So we're talking an enormous amount of biomass here. They make little shelves for every cell that they are. They're often one cell of uh, cellular life forms or in small groups and every cell makes a little silicon shell around it it's like their little house or their barrel around them and it's made of silicon but how can you make a silicon house in and the thing lives about six days right and then there's a new one how do you get all that silicon from the ocean water which is only one ppm that's not much and even if you were able to get filter that much ocean water to get enough silicon atoms even, right? You have to filter many liters of water per cell, I guess, to even get enough silicon for one little tiny house. All that stuff sinks to the bottom and creates layers as thick as six, seven, eight hundred meters or something to that effect. So where does all the silicon come from? And it's very low in solubility, meaning how can you transport the silicon through your body? It's not easily done. Chemistry often has uh, chemical compounds that bind to it in order to facilitate the transporting function. But would it not be much easier for a plant to have a sodium, uh, a potassium, which is more soluble and more available? Just take the potassium, add one hydrogen within the cell in the mitochondria, because that's what they talk about. This happens in the mitochondria in every cell. And then you can transport a readily available element, such as in this example a potassium and the thing adds uh, a hydrogen to it and you create in situ in the place where you want it a calcium or a silicon or whatever that it needs and that seems to be the case or um, what what organisms also often have is a uh, potassium calcium pump or a sodium uh, potassium sodium potassium pump i think it is so you have sodium and potassium which is exactly one oxygen difference and the cell inside the cell or inside the mitochondria you need like 20 times as much of one element in relation to the other and that's a critical balance otherwise your whole biochemistry is off and cells die and become ill and whatnot so in order to keep it up the body needs to be able to do that, but you have to have a lot of that element there. And if you can transport it very poorly, for starters, then you need other functions there. So it appears to me that biochemistry is totally um, um, adopted to this mechanism. Not maybe in huge amounts like, you know, everything in, in the, the life of a growing organism is due to transmutation. That's not what we're saying. But they do seem to fulfill a critical function. And this paper um, points to the culprit there, the, the cyclo ATP acting as a particle accelerator. So this is a phenomenon uh, that, that's utterly mind boggling to even, you know, contemplate this. <clears throat> yeah. And so, and, and since I'm we're talking still about proton capture or hydrogen fusion, if you will, that is very reminiscent of these experiments that we see in the cold fusion community or in the Lanner community or in a, maybe, maybe even in a sapphire. Uh, we're not sure there. But what we're seeing is that hydrogen fusion is, seems to be a readily available thing to do with the help of electricity again. And that's what they talk about in this paper too. So, um, 
what we have to contemplate here is that maybe in the biochemistry slash transmutations that we suspect there, maybe we can find some answers to what we think is a cold fusion phenomenon. Maybe there's something to learn there. Yeah. I mean, certainly if you look at plant cells, if they can do it, I mean, it's not like, you know, when the chicken uh, converts the potassium into calcium, that it uh, goes uh, supernova and, and, and explodes. You know, it, it's not generating a significant amount of heat or requiring a significant amount of heat. So there is an efficiency in whatever they do or however they do it that I guess we haven't quite got to yet. Well, yeah, I mean, we have to be careful to say that any type of transmutation would cause harmful radiation or too energetic. What Andreas likes to say, I think Andreas should, should speak to this. You know, why does the chicken not burn up through the transmutations, <laughs> right? Yeah, <laughs> <clears throat> yeah I mean, um, the step from potassium to calcium is around, uh, I think, 8 MeV, roughly 8 MeV per uh, atom. So um, you can do, of course, do calculations there and what amount of joules that would be, uh, what a joule can do and stuff like that. But uh, what it actually comes down to without doing those calculations is that there must be really a fine grain control of those, these processes in the body or in, in a plant. Uh, otherwise, uh, actually, they would go nuclear. <clears throat> and that is, of course, uh, something that has to be considered. So in we have the nuclear reaction itself, but we also need a very fine grain control. And that basically this together is the solution for um, yeah, this enigma of how do plants and, and uh, animals do this. And we too, I think. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. How do they do it without effectively killing themselves. Yeah, so there are certain steps that we also can look in, in, in the model basically and we can see that, for example, uh, the step from potassium to calcium is just to... one proton put at the right place. No other uh, reshuffling of uh, protons is necessary. No movement. So this would be probably a process that is safe. <laughs> It's not even a normal beta decay step, not no. even that. Exactly. Um, the moment you have rearrangements in the nucleus, uh, beta minus decay, beta plus decay, uh, you have uh, uh, protons move around. That's usually uh, coincides with, with gamma rays. Uh, you um, uh, are in danger. Again, that points to if you do that, if it is necessary to do that, it points to a uh, very fine grain control. Otherwise, uh, you would kill yourself. And maybe that's why there are only a couple of elements whereby nature can do that, right? Right. And it's consistently the same elements. And, and that actually, that might be a good point to have a look at some of the equations that uh, Kavran... Let me just pull this there. So, so these are Kafran's um, equations that he came up with uh, for the transmutation. And I think it was you, Ido, that pointed out the consistency of one thing across all of these. Which well, is the fact not one, but um, three, I guess, is more precise. What we're seeing here is all types of, all kinds of transmutation reactions that I think Kervran indeed suspected as or uh, pointed out as could be taking place, right? Yeah. Not saying they're all truthful. We don't know. It's still, it's still, you know, it's an underdeveloped uh, <laughs> specialism, I would say. But when you when you look at it, you see lithium is a suspect. You see hydrogen is a suspect. You see oxygen is a suspect, and a carbon is a suspect. Oh, and of course, the one underlying principle would be it's actually always a metallic-like element. And mind you, oxygen and carbon are also a bit metallic-like, definitely. Plus something. And plus something is those four types. Oxygen, lithium, hydrogen, and 
carbon mostly. And those steps are uh, super interesting because if you look at a, put, um, a sodium and a potassium, I'm pretty sure it's somewhere in that list there. Right, it's the top center column. Sodium 23 plus oxygen 16 yields potassium 39, K39. And that's exactly an oxygen step. And those two atoms are totally look-alike. So they are the the earth elements or the earth alkaline element. I'm not sure which low it is now. Yeah, and they are totally look-alike. So these steps seem to be taking place in biology. And we also speculate or hypothesize that these are things, you know, taking place in geology uh, processes. Or maybe these biochemistry processes that we are suspecting here and looking at here might actually contribute to the chemical makeup of the soil and therefore in the long run of our geology, right? Um, they could play an important role here. Mm. So I think this is this is important to take away here. And all these steps are very logical in the when we look in the SAM model, in the builder, they are very logical steps, if you will, especially the hydrogen. Yeah, you mean the ones where you're just adding a single one? Yeah. yeah. They make total sense. They make total sense in, 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 yeah. But obviously, mainstream, it doesn't make sense because these are all nuclear reactions and you're back to the same problem as before. People don't take it seriously because the models that they use cannot predict that this is possible. Right, so... I, I think I should point out uh, a little bit of fundamentals, fundamental uh, physics stuff here. The SAM model has, as we say, no neutrons, meaning there are no neutrons, neutral particles in the nucleus. We say there are only protons and electrons in the nucleus. And that's the big difference with the standard model. But because we have negative and positive charges, if you will, in the nucleus through a specific makeup, in, in contrast to the mainstream model where you have only positive protons there and neutral neutrons, which don't really do anything in that sense, then you cannot simply add a proton there because the thing is already very positive in the standard model. In our model, however, there's, you know, a localized uh, charge effect. It can be more negative, it can be more positive. And those neutrons that we pointed out in these depictions, those yellow spheres, are relatively uh, negative there, very negative in relation to the rest of the nucleus. And that's exactly where that next deuteron pair needs to be created in order to transmutate upwards to the next element, i.e. potassium to calcium. So we have a very different nucleus. It's a charged nucleus with positive and negative charges there in relation to only a very positive nucleus in mainstream. So we ha already have a very different uh, understanding here, right? Very different way of looking at it. So in our mind, Proton capture is actually something that comes out of the model as that should be relatively easy because it's not even that beta plus or beta minus decay whereby an electron moves in or out of the nucleus or in the standard model an electron is created somehow in the nucleus and then is emitted. That's not even happening. All you need to do is put that positive proton there and the whole thing says, I'm really happy with that new configuration. Thank you. Now I call myself the next element. So it should be easy. That comes from the model. Yeah, so effectively, this is an example of one of those yellow ones, is, is that would actually be slightly more negative and therefore it would want to attract a, a proton to this part to, to complete it, to move on to the next one, and the same here as well. Right, so that spot would actually be, at the very least, at the very minimal, less resistant to that proton there coming in. It does not mean that the proton will go in fully automatically, right? We may still need a somewhat accelerated proton or something to that effect, but then comes to mind again that cyclic ATP thing that acts as a particle accelerator. Here's a push for this proton here, and it's all very geometrical, so these molecules, it was a sketch there, but it's very geometric always, very symmetric, geometric, meaning you can have that proton totally accelerating into that other nucleus there, and God knows exactly what the biochemistry is doing here, but one thing is for sure, it does it through 
electricity. And electricity causes, of course, magnetic fields, voltage differences, uh, steep curvatures, and accelerations. And then all you need to do is shoot it at the right atom, if you will, and you have your transmutation. And the biology says, thank you very much. That's exactly what I needed. Yeah. Seems so simple. <laughs> well, maybe it is. I'm not saying maybe, it's simple well, to do, but... <laughs> um, no, well, exactly. Nature never does things that are complicated. Okay. It's just hard to understand sometimes what is going on. But th to me, fundamentally, this seems so logical. It's well, just a question agree, of... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's... Uh... It yeah. is amazing when you're looking at this, and, and, and maybe it's a good moment to say that, you know, we're dealing with a uh, difficult topic here, transmutations, and people come up with the term alchemy all the time. Um, and we, we can call it that, but we forget that for the past hundred years we have been doing all kinds of transmutations, right? There's a whole field of research and practical applications there. From stuff, uh, contrast fluid uh, into your body for certain uh, x-rays or whatnot, right, which is an isotope that you get in your body then, which only has a half-life of a few days usually, to uh, bombs, to nuclear power plants, um, batteries for voyagers, and um, there are so many applications here. So we're doing it a long time already, many ways. And somehow we are very resistant to the idea that biology does this too, because we associate nuclear technology with gamma yeah. rays or neutrons or harmful radiation because that has to be no that is a result of using specifically uranium etc right the most heavy ones which are ready to go off anyhow which we see through the model it only needs a relative not a slight nudge that's why adding a neutron there a slow neutron even you don't need a fast proton you don't need anything special just shoot the thing with lots of neutrons and it will start to fission so relatively speaking that is a very simple thing to do that's why we have that technology but it's also a dirty technology in that sense so maybe biology is still much much cleverer than we are nature is still much cleverer than we are and we can only look and learn and copy i think right and understand that nature uh, can do nuclear technology can do transmutations and only uh, only in a much safer way yeah yeah, I absolutely agree. Well, I mean, I think this is probably a good point for us to sort of pause or end the, the, the current conversation. Um, I think that's a re really nice end note to end on. I, I think one of the things I would like to explore in the future is then taking this idea of biological transmutation and looking at the, the geology, because that is something that we have on the list. But uh, I, I think that's worth exploring in, in more detail as well. Again, looking at, you know, the formation of ores, the formation of sedimentary layers, you know, the differences that we see in the oceans and on, on the land. Yeah, that's, that's just one little uh, um, um, teaser, if you will, right? Uh, we already mentioned the silicon in the ocean water, which is about 1 ppm. And if you understand that those uh, diatoms create every six day or so, days or so the, that new silicon shell. And I'm quoting here from, I think it was from Wikipedia. So, um, doo -doo -doo -doo. living diatoms make up a significant portion of the Earth's biomass. They generate about 20 to 50 percent of the oxygen produced on the planet each year. So imagine that they're doing more than all the Amazon forests and whatnot together, right? Yeah. Taking in over 6.7 billion metric tons of silicon, silicon we're talking about, each year from the waters in which they live. And that water has only one ppm silicon, mind you. So how can they do that, right? And constitu constitute nearly half of the organic material found in the oceans. The shells of those dead diatoms can reach as much as a half a mile or 800 meters deep on the ocean floor. That's, so that's a huge depository of all that silicon there, right? Yeah. And where does all the new silicon come from? Very poor uh, solubility, etc. So how do these things even live? Why would they even use the silicon, right? So then it states the exact mechanism of transferring silica absorbed by a dome 
to the cell wall is unknown. <laughs> well, maybe because there is none, right? And that could be the way. So, yeah, I think this is, this is, this is one of those examples where you start to think about it. The ungodly amount of silicon that is uh, used every year to create that enormous amount of biomass, right? We're talking how much again? 6.7 billion metric tons of silicon. And it all comes from that very little bit of silicon in the ocean water every year again. I have a hard mind accepting that. So I rather accept that those algae create the silicon right then and there. And maybe they are responsible, therefore, to creating a thick sedimentary layer of 600 or 800 meters thick with lots and lots of silicon. And maybe that's how the Earth came to be so silicon rich in the continents, right? And yep. again, this is something very unproven. We understand that, right? You, we need to do our homework and look at the details and look at the numbers and all that. But just pointing this out, it becomes uh, a hard case accepting the current models, if you will. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's a lot to be discussed when we look at the geology and and aspects related to that. But I think for now, I'd just like to say a massive thank you to both of you and to Jan, who's obviously already left the call. 